Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm not a real GP. I'm a, a clever GP who works at the university. But um, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, work that's been done with lots of frontline GPs working in deprived areas, the, the Deep End Project. Can I just say, are there many GPs in the audience? Putting their hands up. None. One. one. Hi. Well, I'm not, I'm not alone then, which is, which is good. But I think that, but that's qu qu actually quite, quite something. The reason why I'm speaking and not a deep end GP is they have great difficulty getting out of practice, uh, much more so than most people working in the in the health service. Uh, there are a couple of one-page summaries of deep end meetings in your handouts. Uh, and the, the full version of those summaries are available on the website at the bottom. So, a deep end perspective on mental health issues. And this is just to park the fact that clearly there's a lot of determinants of mental health problems outside the health service or beyond the, the realms of what we can do to help. Uh, the idea of social medicine diagnosing and treating the ills of sick societies isn't new, but it's never been more topical or important. Uh, but that's not going to be my theme. My theme is uh, what can we do about the problems that people have got. And I'm just going to refer briefly to this Lancet paper, three year, years old now, one research paper of the year on multimorbidity in Scotland. This is based on a third of Scottish general practices, which is uh, about 335 of them submitting electronic data showing, going from left to right, young to old, the increase in multimorbidity, that's two or more conditions, as you get older, uh, always higher in the deprived red line than in the affluent blue line. Nothing very strange or unfamiliar about that. But here's a, a slide. Along the bottom, it's counting the number of physical conditions that a patient would have from naught to five. And what the slopes show is the increasing prevalence of a mental health problem as your number of physical health problems increases. So the epidemiology of multimorbidity in Scotland does have consequences for mental health as a comorbidity. And again, it's much more common in deprived areas than in affluent areas. Uh, this is a slide which shows uh, the affluent, most affluent tenth of the Scottish population at the top, and the more deprived going down to the most deprived at the bottom, uh, number 10. And it shows that compared to the most affluent decile, the prevalence of any mental health disorder, as diagnosed in general practice, more than doubles across the social spectrum. And similarly, it shows that as the number of physical disorders increases, the prevalence of a mental health disorder increases by even more, by several fold. So this is the context in which a lot of general practice takes place. This slide from that paper shows on the left all the main chronic conditions. And in each bar, the figure on the left-hand side is the, number, is, the, is the percentage of people who, who only have that problem. So for all of the chronic conditions in Scotland, people who have only that condition and nothing else are always a minority because most people have one and usually two or three more conditions. And that's true for, phys for physical conditions at the top and for uh, mental health conditions at the bottom. And of course, when we do research on conditions, including mental health conditions, we focus on the left-hand side of this slide to exclude the people who complicate our lives by having other problems. And here again on the left-hand side are those chronic conditions, but this time it shows you the prevalence of the comorbidities. And I'd just like to draw your attention to about the seventh or eighth column along, which shows that the depression as a comorbidity, and this is a, a definition of depression that requires four prescriptions at least over one year, it's about a fifth or a sixth of all patients have depression as a comorbidity. 
And just to the left of that, about a fifth to a quarter of patients are on prescription analgesics with whatever they may contain for undiagnosed pain. So the conditions on the left-hand side, whether you have hypertension or diabetes or chest disease or whatever, are often complicated uh, by mental health problems, requiring a holistic approach. Now, here's data from Glasgow, a bit old now. It was collated by Joy Tomlinson, just counting caseloads in various parts of the service. And it shows you the number of people uh, attending in a particular year various uh, services, many in the mental health sector. Uh, uh, only in one case getting into five figures. At the, at the bottom, there's the population served by all of the general practices in, in Glasgow, which takes it over a million. And clearly, if uh, the prevalence of depression is a fifth or a sixth, that's an awful lot of people uh, outside mental health services with, with mental health problems. Uh, this compares uh, practice uh, contacts, least deprived at the top, most deprived at the bottom. It shows that whilst there isn't much of a social gradient for cardiovascular disease or chest disease, columns two and three, column one shows a steep gradient with mental health problems, much commoner in deprived areas. And for prescriptions, there's a slight increase in antibiotics and in statins, but a big increase in the prescribing of antidepressants as you move along the social spectrum. Now, here's a slide, um, inverse care law in Scotland. I hear you've heard about that already. The inverse care law isn't a law. It's a policy which restricts care based on need, which has been prevalent in the UK ever since the inception of the NHS. Along the bottom, the population of Scotland is divided into tenths, that's half a million people under each figure. Blue is the increase in mortality under 75, um, and compared to a figure of 100 for the most affluent decile, it more than doubles across the social spectrum, as indeed does in red the prevalence of multimorbidity involving both a physical and a mental health problem. The black line is general practice funding, which pays for GPs, receptionists, practice nurses, premises, not prescribing. And you can see that it's pretty much flat. There's a peak in decile too, that's because of remote and rural practices which have their own needs. The, the green line is the is consultation rates, which do increase a bit, as you'd expect, in the face of the burden of morbidity. But with a fixed resource at the bottom, you can only increase consultation rates by shortening their length or working a longer day. So here's a, a fairly gross feature of the National Health Service in Scotland in terms of the same level of resource addressing quite different levels of need, the inverse care law in Scotland. Well, what's going on on the right-hand side of those, that slide when patients meet doctors? We know that from a study of 3,000 consultations, which shows that in deprived areas, consultations are typically characterized by multimorbidity and social complexity. They are shorter. Both patients and professionals have reduced expectations because they're realistic. There is less enablement. There is less health literacy. And the practitioners are under greater stress. Both the patients and the doctors are under greater stress. This is from the same study and it, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you what the point is so that you don't have to go through the slide, but this is comparing physical consultations in deprived and affluent areas and second from the bottom is the patient enablement score having consulted for a physical problem and there's no difference between affluent and deprived in terms of that outcome of consultations. But if you move to the next slide, this is for psychosocial problems, and if you look in the same place, you'll see that there is quite a substantial difference in enablement uh, between affluent and deprived areas. In the whole study, the patients who were least likely to be enabled, that is saying that they were better able to cope with life of their condition having seen the doctor, the least likely group to be enabled were people with a mental health problem in a deprived area. And that must be one of the consequences 
of the inverse care law. This shows how, consulta how as consultations lengthen from five minutes at the left to 15 minutes or more on the right, the stress reported by practitioners at the end of the consultation increases steeply in deprived areas, whereas hardly at all in affluent areas. And we think that's because, not just because of the, the content of long consultations in deprived areas, but the fact that they're very likely preceded and followed by consultations of similar intensity and complexity. The same study which asked about an empathy found remarkably that you could get empathy reported by patients, the doctor listened, cared, understood, uh, without enablement, but you never got enablement without empathy, which shows the importance of the relationship as the basis for achieving almost anything. Um, in life, as in the film, nothing very much happens in brief encounters. Uh, minimal interventions have a place, but not a big place. When deep end GPs were commenting on their CPD needs, many of the issues highlighted were the problems which occur more commonly in deprived areas at the top of the list. But the generic needs are at the bottom. The challenges of engaging with patients with whom it is difficult to engage how to deal with complexity in high volume, because every practice is, has some deprived patients, but deep end practices are dealing with it in high volume. And how do you apply evidence which comes from elsewhere, from studies of patients who only have single conditions? These are the challenges of working in the deep end. Because the, the, there are two reasons we came out of one of our workshops as to the high prevalence of mental health problems in deprived areas. And one is just the, the arithmetical relationship with the number of other conditions. But another feature that came out strongly was the emotional damage that people carried with them from bad experiences in early life, leading to problems with attachment with uh, family, friends and practitioners and services. These are the intrinsic strengths of general practice, not necessarily general practitioners. Because of the way the health service is structured, it has contact, coverage, continuity, coordination, flexibility, relationships. Nowhere else in the public service has these features to the same degree. It's not exclusive to general practice and it's not necessarily, ev necessarily even within general practice. But these features are a huge resource which make general practice a natural hub for local health systems. There's actually a profusion of hubs in the health service, uh, far too many. Uh, and there's a culture difference between general practice and other services which often have entry criteria, they ration access with waiting times, they deliver a uh, focused intervention often based on evidence and when that work is done they discharge. Whereas the work of general practice is unconditional, it deals with whatever the patient has got, combinations, and, and the patient is not discharged. And getting these two systems to work together is a challenge. The view of deep end GPs is that mental health services do an impressive job in terms of what they do for secondary care and some aspects of primary care. But they leave a lot of work for general practice still to do, especially the kind of patients who don't meet the criteria that services are aiming to help. Now, general practices on their own are insufficient. Consultations are insufficient, clearly. There needs to be links with almost everybody else in the health system as listed here. Uh, the hub on the left needs to be connected by spokes to rims to become a wheel because a hub by itself is not the whole deal. And as I'll come on to just shortly, integrated care depends on multiple relationships. There's been some work in the deep end about looking outside. In the last 10 years with the incentives of the COF, practices have become very introspective. But we've done work looking at the extent to which practices know about what's going on round about them. 
uh, a Lynx project uh, showed that even if you knew what there was round about, it was difficult to establish and develop the relationships. But a beginning was made, including, based on the primary care collaborative model, practices working as collectives with protected time to share activity and experience with a GP lead to co-design initiatives with other services. That's a model that we've applied in lots of areas, uh, ho hopefully with Sam H shortly. Um, the Bridge Project uh, told us something very important, and that is when you try to link the practices knowledge of patients with local services, this, in this case it was physical and social activity for the elderly, there wasn't a blueprint that you could roll out or apply because lots of patients didn't fit or want the blueprint. Uh, the project developed by trial and error so that the local system became customized to local circumstances, geography, history, culture. And over a period of time, a system developed locally. And you could encapsulate that in a blueprint, but a blueprint wasn't how it started or how it was developed. You know, as Spock said to Captain Kirk, God bless him, uh, it's not logical, Captain. And the development of local health systems is often not logical. But that's not to say we shouldn't be doing it. In the Lynx Worker program, Project, which attacks a full-time Lynx practitioner to connect practices with local services, uh, mainly in the third sector, one of the interesting findings is that most, of, well, a lot of their work is not signposting or linking to other services. It's fixing it for patients who are floundering with dysfunctional and fragmented healthcare services, because multimorbidity requires work for patients in dealing with a whole variety of different services. And that requires skills that many patients don't have. Uh, one of the deep end reports described the, the, the double whammy of having to negotiate so many services whilst not having the, the personal attributes and skills to do that. This is one of the deep end reports. I commend it to you. And I'll just quickly canter through the summaries of the first one, which many of the points of which I've already mentioned in terms of multimorbidity, inverse care law, allostatic load, long-term consequences of emotional damage, the problems of attachment and engagement, the irrelevance of heat targets, at least in general practice, they just don't register at all on the general practice radar. Uh, improving links with, within primary care, that's with community health services, there, there's work to, to do there. Uh, We're working with Michael Smith in Glasgow on that clearly need to improve links between primary and secondary care and the, the, the third sector. And there's a lot to learn from the homeless services, which seem to be ahead of mainstream general practice, both in their approach to patients and in the extent to which they are surrounded by supportive other services. So um, that's a canter through uh, a couple of meetings that we've had in the last year reviewing mental health issues in the deep end and uh, clearly given the nature of the meeting there is work to do in crossing that bridge between the world of mental health services and the world of general practice thank you